All right, so um, hello and welcome. And um, this is a sort of back-to-back -back extended training session, so hopefully you're all here for the right thing. Uh, my name is Jelaine Lovejoy, um, and I, I don't usually like to do the whole, like, here's my resume, but just a little bit about my background, because I think it helps frame the kind of perspective that I have. So I am a lawyer. Um, in the US, and uh, I started out my sort of open source legal career by kind of jumping up the deep end when I ended up at a company that provided services around open source um, scanning and support services and so forth and so on. Um, so I had, uh, and then later I moved to a, a, a company that some of the Brits and the artists might know as Arm up the road in Cambridge, and so I've had a, a I've always been in-house, I've had a really fortunate perspective of seeing how a lot of different companies uh, manage or don't manage open source over the past like decade, um, and been involved in a lot of uh, improvements when I was at ARM. I'm not there any longer, and I've also been in really deeply involved with a couple projects that you've heard mentioned depending on the sessions that you've been in. Um, one of them's called the Software Package Data Exchange, or SPDX. I've been the maintainer of the SPX license list since its inception, for better or for worse, and also was one of the founding members of Open Chain. If those, I'm gonna explain a little more about what those are sort of later, um, so I'll come, come back to that. Uh, so I, I've, I've been very fortunate as sort of being a lawyer, but also having sort of a community experience directly in working in the open source community, and it's been something I've really enjoyed a lot. So hopefully I have some, helpful info for you today. Um, so I think since we have two sessions, I don't know how I'm supposed to do this, but um, maybe we can have like a little break in the middle so someone can tell me when we're at the 45 minute mark and hopefully I've timed my slides to have a convenient break at that point and, um, and then we'll carry on with the, the, the second session and hopefully have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. I'm not real, um, you know, stringent on the Q&A thing. So if you have questions as I'm going along, just raise your hand. If it's something I'm gonna come over later, I might ask you to hold that. Um, so our trail map, as I like to say, better than road map, gratuitous picture of Colorado where I live. Um, so we're gonna cover some of the topics that are actually from the open chain curriculum. If you, did, how many people saw Andrew Katz talk yesterday? Okay, some. So um, Open Chain, as I mentioned, is a, is a collaborative project about establishing sort of baseline requirements for good open source management. And one of the things that's come out of that project is a, a training curriculum. The idea was that uh, myself and other colleagues and friends in this industry all probably were doing training in our various companies and realized that our training slides probably looked a lot the same, covered a lot of the same material, so wouldn't it make a lot more sense to open source that material so that other people didn't have to redo that work. Um, so the training program that uh, ARM was a, or is still a member of Open Chain that I had developed there got um, incorporated into that curriculum. So you sort of, if you go look at Open Chain, <laughs> open chain training slides, you might see some familiar material, which is great, right? Um, and then I've got a little bit more of my, my spin on it at the end. Um, and so those uh, that we'll cover a little bit about intellectual property law as it relates to open source, very high level view. I'll talk about that in a second. And I mean, the goal here is really to just give you a basic foundation of knowledge that'll sort of can help you start thinking about building, you know, policy and processes and so forth at your organization. Um, intro to open source licenses and then an overview of, of sort of how open source or how organizations engage with open source or use it and what the key considerations are there. And one of the other themes I have is, is, is I always find that terminology is always an issue. I've actually, it's been interesting listening to some of the other talks. I actually have seen some, you know, pleasantly surprised at some consistency in how people refer to things. That's always good. Um, but, you know, your starting point when you start to develop these, you know, these uh, processes in your company is like, are we all speaking the same language? When we say something, do we mean the same thing? And if you're a company, if you know, if you're a global company, that's a, you know a, another layer of challenge. You have people who, for whom English isn't their first language, or you have different languages. So, so making sure you have that established. And the other thing to throw into that mix is there's a, there's certain legal terms of art that have that use common English words, but have a specific meaning in the law, and then in a specific jurisdiction. So it's, I'm gonna try to point those out because that can also um, cause some misunderstandings. Um, but I think the goal is sort of to you know, start out and kind of have like the basic knowledge because the other thing I found over the last decade of working in this space is 
especially as open source has become more ubiquitous, is that everybody thinks they know, oh yeah, yeah, I know about open source. And then there's sort of gaps in your knowledge or blind spots, and so you, know, you don't know what you don't know. So it's always good to kind of come back to basics. I know some of you in here, this is, uh, this is not really new. Okay, so obviously as a US lawyer, this is pretty much a US law pers perspective. Um, having worked uh, a lot in the UK, I, I have good reason to believe there's a lot of consistency. Copyright law is somewhat consistent across most jurisdictions in terms of like the main principles, but, but like I said, disclaimer, it is, uh, it is a US law perspective. Most of the open source licenses were written in the US, so that's not an entirely bad place to start. Um, it's not totally being a typical myopic American, but, uh, but they also don't have a jurisdictional clause a lot of times, so you, know, you have to take that into account. Um, this is not intended to try to make you a lawyer. This is a really brief 30,000 foot view. And so I, I always think it's important though to just you know, have some, again, basic level of understanding because we start talking about open source license, we start talking about interpretation of open source licenses, and we've like gone, well, hold on a second. You know, these are copyright licenses. There's copyright law, possibly patent law, implications of trademark law. And if you haven't, you know, if you don't have sort of some basic understanding there, then you're sort of putting the cart before the horse. And I meant to ask, so how many people in here are lawyers? Okay, how many people are developers, engineers, and business, business people? What other roles? How many people are involved in their open source, an open source program out there? All right, so we've got a, a whole mix. So I don't know where everyone's knowledge is, but hopefully, if it's a refresher, it'll be good. Okay, so what is intellectual property? Um, I think this is a, kind of can be an overloaded term depending on the space of the company you work in. It can kind of refer to different things, but from a sort of a legal perspective, I think of it as an umbrella term because it's really kind of talking about a, 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 a collection of areas of law, which is really patents, copyright, trademark, and trade secret, which is a bit US specific, but you, know, you think of that as sort of confidential information. And there's a lot of confusion I've noticed over the boundaries of each, which isn't really helped by there being some overlap, but probably less than you'd think. The other confusion I think that gets caused is if you're a patent attorney, patent attorneys often talk about IP and only, that sort of only includes patents. So sometimes when people say IP, they're really talking about patents. But for those of us who practice in the other areas of IP, like I said, like I said it is an umbrella term. But, um, so it's good to just sort of understand the different, uh, you know, the different justifications for the different areas of law. And then the, really the main focus here, and I'm going to kind of go in not necessarily the order on this slide, is copyright law because that's really what's most relevant when it comes to open source and, and patent law and a little bit trademarks. Obviously, trade secret doesn't really apply here, right? Trade secret is about keeping things secret. We're working in the open, so um, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about that. Um, and like I said, there's sort of these different theories of, of why things are protected. The, the big one in, in, the, in, in sort of US terms, in term, it's, it's like promoting um, innovation, promoting the progress of science and useful arts, and that's sort of incentivizing research and development. And that's sort of where copyright and um, patent law uh, come from. And then, but trademark is actually quite different. So I see a lot of confusion there. Um, so, Let's talk a little bit about trademarks. So trademarks are about protecting words, lo logos, slogans that identify the source of the product. And so the, 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 the goal here is actually consumer and brand protection. So it's not, it's not the same as that innovation piece that we'll talk about with patents and copyright. And avoiding um, uh, consumer confusion. So the test for infringement is, is there a likelihood of consumer confusion? You know, if, um, if I put a, a swoosh mark that looks a lot like uh, oops, Nike on a pair of shoes, um, and you're used to the brand recognition and the quality that associated with Nike shoes, and you buy my shoes, you, you're you know likely to be confused, and Nike may have a good lawsuit against me. Um, so it must be source identifying and distinct, and you have to be the first to use the mark in co uh, commerce. So another another thing about trademark law that people get confused with is you have to enforce the mark. So if someone is using a mark similar to yours or misusing your mark and you don't say anything about it, that can actually be sort of dangerous. And I've seen that people, 
get really upset if they get, say, a, a cease and desist letter, and sometimes you have to as well, you know, the trademark owner kind of needs to do that. If they don't, they can kind of, you know, dilute or almost potentially lose their mark or threat of that. So, you know, you have to kind of police it a little bit. Um, and it's, it, it, a trademark can be, um, can go on for forever. There's no limit. As long as you're using it and you're, you know, you're actively kind of, um, enforcing it, then uh, it stays in effect. There's some things about a, t a trademark becoming generic, you might have heard. It's, it's actually quite rare, so I'm not going to go into the details of that. And trademarks can be registered or unregistered. Um, I think there's different regimes on that, but in the, in, like in the US, you'll see TM, and that means it's unregistered. It might be pending registration or not. And R means it's been registered. And, and like a lot of things, a lot there's sort of some benefits to having it registered especially if, um, if you have an infringement suit later, but um, it doesn't mean it's not protected. If it's not, it doesn't have to be registered to be protected. Um, so the key thing there, like I said, is that consumer protection and sort of brand identification. And trademarks can be really, really valuable and important in open source. And I actually think that we'll see them becoming more important uh, over time. So let's see. All right. Let's talk a little bit about patents. So. Patents protect useful innovations or inventions or ideas, right? And so some of the requirements to get a patent has to be new. It has to be something, you know, novel as compared to sort of what's already out there in the world. So, you know, you're not going to patent something that's already there. You hear about people talking about prior art searches. It has to be inventive. So it has to be something that's not obvious to someone having the ordinary skill in the arts. It has to, you know, actually be something, you know, new and cool and not just sort of an obvious next step. It's got to be useful. Um, has to have it's, you know it's, this is not about art. That's more the realm of, of or creativity. They're more the realm of um, copyright, and it has to be a patentable subject matter. Now, I'm not going to get into that debate. There's a huge debate on software. There's some people, especially in the free software community, that think so software should never have been patentable. Um, there has an interesting sort of history in the U.S. of, of software patents becoming more common and then more recently some case law that people, some people see as sort of chipping away a little bit at that. Um, but, you know, patent attorneys will really argue on what that all means, of course, because it's all case law. Uh, so, and then it's also, you know, what, what is software, what is a software patent to begin with? I mean, how do you draw that distinction? So that's a, you know, that's a very um, ripe topic, I think. The, the, the relevant thing I've seen in terms of developers is sometimes they're like, oh, well, software isn't patentable, and so we're okay. And, you know, that's certainly um, probably not a, a misunderstanding you want perpetuated in your organization, especially if you're interested in filing patents. Um, and so then there's also, it must be disclosed. Somehow I did not put that on there. And that's sort of a, a quid pro quo for the patent process, right? We don't really like monopolies, um, but a patent is basically a 20-year monopoly. You have the exclusive right to, to, to practice that invention, and, and your sort of bargain for that is that you've disclosed in your patent application how to do it and how to make it and, and, and so forth and so on. So that's, that's sort of how the, that bargain is um, played out. So And then the rights are assignable, meaning you can transfer uh, ownership of the rights. So what do you get? So you don't actually get anything when you when you get a patent, but it's sort of like a negative right. You get the right to stop other people from doing things that are sort of your exclusive right. So it's just, like I said, a limited term monopoly in return for making that invention available to public, and and the ability to to you know stop other people from doing things or charge have them you know pay you money for that. Obviously via licensing. I'll talk more about licensing later. Obviously. Um, and yeah, and so then the key the key actions are make, use, sell, offer for sale, um, and an invention. And then there's also the claims of the patent. So when you have arguments over infringement, you get down to like, well, what was the actual, you know, different parts of the patent, and what did they uh, in potentially infringe? So copyright protects original works of authorship, and it, it needs to be creative. Although the threshold for creativity is quite low, there's some really interesting case law in the U.S. about that. The protection attaches as soon as the work is created. So it, you don't have to have a copyright notice. Now, there's good reasons to have a copyright notice, but that's not what tells you that the, the work's protected. It covers literary, dramatic, or, you know, all, all kinds of sort of creative works. And, uh, and, and software is protected actually under the literary work 
piece, if you will. Um, the copyright owner is the author, whoever wrote it. If it's, you're employed, then um, there's something called work for hire in the US that means that it's, um, it's the, the employer is the author. Now, that was mentioned this morning in the keynote. There's, there's also the fact that you probably have an, you know, it's not co so, so cut and dry, right? So what if you're a contractor? And there's a lot of case law on that. A lot of times you'll have an agreement that sets those rights out very clearly. Probably says, you know, as a contractor, we're going to treat anything you create like as if it's a work for hire or something along those lines. Um, it's better to have that clarity written down in your employment or contractor agreement because that's why you end up with really interesting case laws when it wasn't written down and everybody thought something different. Um, and you know, employment law varies from country to country. So how sort of far your employer can go in terms of what they own. And we talked a little bit, there's some talk this morning about you know, sort of own time versus work time. It is a bit fuzzy and it can vary in different countries. So you know, I can't really give you like a blanket rule. But if you're an employer, uh, employee, obviously you wanna you know, read your employment agreement, be clear on what it says and ask questions about it to be, make sure everybody's sort of on the same page. I mean, a lot of times these things are, you know, expectations are key, right? Um, so what do you get with copyright? Um, you get the exclusive right to do and authorize any of the enumerated, enumerated rights. One of the um, analogies that's often used is it's like a bundle of sticks. You have this sort of bundle of sticks of these rights and you can give them away, but they're, they're yours. So it's sort of similar to patents in that way. So the key, the key rights in terms of software is copy or reproduce um, prepared derivative works and, and distribute copies, so or redistribute. Um, Derivative works is a legal term of art in the U.S. and and so it's it has some similar analogies in EU or UK law, but it's a it's a, it is a legal term of art. So this is one of the great examples of those things I was saying where it's you know it's just a derivative is a normal English word but has a very specific um, meaning. Um, well, <laughs> it has a very specific meaning and yet it's mostly defined by case law. So. I'll talk a little bit more about why that causes um, engineers in particular, you know, hair tearing out feelings because it's, uh, it's a bit smushy. Um, but anyway, it's important, important to kind of understand that that does have sort of a, a legal, a specific legal meaning that's mostly defined by case law. Um, so uh, let's see, what else did I want to say here? Um, So, and, and the rights are obviously assignable as well. Assignable is a, a full transfer of rights. Um, so I, I have a few things here on sort of what copyright doesn't cover because there's this sort of, it's easier to just say anything you create covered by copyright as soon as you, you know, it's fixed in a, you know, as soon as you write it down or you, it's fixed in a tangible medium would be the technical term. Um, but copyright, First of all, it covers the expression, not the idea. So this is the other area of confusion I see. Ideas are the realm of patent law, and, and expression is the realm of, of copyright. So the, the one way to um, think about this, or the classic law school exam, is like if two programmers go, you know, are given a task in two different parts of the world, they've never met, there's like you know, no contact between them, and they, at the same time, write the same code because they you know, are answering this, this uh, question, um, they both have copyright. There's no infringement for that. Whereas in patents, that would be quite different. So um, that's a, a, a challenging uh, uh, thing. Um, so like the, the other, you know, describing a method is not, uh, that's like the, the famous case law in the US is, is not copyrightable, it's the expression of, of how of that is. Uh, in, in, in the book, in this case, in that case. Now, related to that, there's this concept called the merger doctrine, where if the underlying idea can only be expressed in one way, that the idea and the expression merges, and you can't have copyright over that, because then you have like a, a monopoly over an idea. So um, there's also a concept called de minimis, which meaning like the copying is so minute or trivial that it doesn't rise the level of copyright law. You gotta be careful on that. The case law you see around that is usually music sampling. 
Um, and there's, I think, was one case where, you know, three notes was not de minimis because it was like the riff of the song and super recognizable. So, you know, it's not a clear, can be, you know, I think sometimes developers are like, well, there's only two lines. They're like, well, if that was like the most important functionality of the whole code, you know, uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, fair use obviously has gotten a lot more attention recently thanks to uh, Oracle and Google. Um, it's called fair de dealing in the UK. It's a similar concept. Um, it's permitted use as sort of a, a defense to an infringement case for, for limited reasons that are sort of considered, you know, a, a, a kind of almost like a public good kind of thing, right? You know, criticism, parody, news reporting, teaching, library. And, and, and what's interesting is in the UK, it's, it's very specifically spelled out. So there's sort of these clear categories. And in the US, there's sort of this like hinting at it, examples, but really, again, it's this like four or several part test that the judges apply, <laughs> not always so easy to find the patterns there. But the, the thing to remember is um, I've heard people say, oh, no, it's, a, I, my, my, I, it's fair use. And, and, my con and again, it's another one of those like legal term of arts. And you know, my response to that is like, well, you may think it's fair for you to use it, but that doesn't mean it's fair use. <laughs> and you know, usually don't want to. If you're fighting that battle, you're, you're in court. Um, public domain, uh, which I'll talk about again later, is works that are where copyright has expired or it, it's otherwise for some reason not protected. But um, that's another thing I've heard people say, oh, it's in the public domain. And, and that has, again, a very specific legal meaning. It's pretty consistent across the jurisdictions I've looked at, but it's, it, you know, it, it, again, it's sort of a, you could sort of say that in casual talk, right, and understand what it means. So you just have to, again, be careful of kind of uh, open source is, is not, and public domain is not the, the same thing. Okay, so licenses. Basically, licenses are what gives you permission, right? This is the, the, the like, I have all these rights, and, but I can say, you know, Matthew, you can do this because I've given you a license. And, and, and that's to you know, basically exercise a right that otherwise would be reserved for the, um, for the owner of the IP in wh whichever case. So you know, typical kinds of use allowed is going to usually track on sort of the statutory language. Sometimes you use more, more sort of regular language um, depending on how you sort of are drafting your, um, your license. And then you can place conditions on that. So you can say, you know, I give you the right to copy the software provided that you, you know, provide a copy of the license. Um, they might be an exclusive license, it might be non-exclusive, there may be geographical limits, it may be perpetual or for only a period of time, and then it may also include con more contractual type terms like warranties or indemnification or, you know, if it's software, you might have support terms and upgrade and maintenance and so forth. And just to sort of on that note, so open source licenses are copyright licenses sort of at their core as, a, as, a, as like a starting point. They may include um, an, uh, some ta an explicit patent grant. They may include other terms about patents, but in terms of just talking about like the grants and the permissions. Um, and they may include an implied patent grant. Um, if you heard the talk yesterday, there's some, uh, some debate over this apparently now. Um, so l let me just explain what it means. I was gonna talk about this later, but so some licenses just explicitly say, you know, a patent license grant to, you know, it's a very, very clear. Apache 2.0 would be the most obvious one. And there's an interesting sort of history, if you look at the chronology of when open source licenses were written, of when those grants started showing up. And, and you know, there's no like cause correlation, you know, you could argue, but I, I think there is a, a sort of a, a correlation in any way in terms of like the rise of software patents and then and also in more bigger companies getting involved in open source and then seeing those, those um, terms start to pop up in licenses, you know, so you can make some conclusions on maybe why that might have been there then but not beforehand. Um, some licenses don't explicitly mention patents um, and so there's always this sort of question, well, what does that mean? And I think it's important to think about why do you need to answer that, right? So because it's, you know, it's kind of a specific scenario. If I'm contributing to a project and I have patents that read on, you know, I'm definitely giving a copyright license and I have patents that read, also read on that same software, then 
what the open source community doesn't want to happen is for me to then be able to sort of Trojan horse the software, right? So if I, I'm like, oh, I'll give you a copyright license, but now you have to pay me for the patent license, and that's not always obvious, you know, to know if there's patents covering something. And so that's another, you know, that's really I, like the, the why you see patent grants in um, open source licenses was to sort of protect the, the community. Um, so if you're contributing and you've got a license that maybe some people say there isn't a patent grant or you could read a patent grant in, I think a pragmatic view, and I, and I know for a fact that a lot of uh, having worked in-house and talked to a lot of in-house counsel, I, I mean, you gotta look at your risk scenario, right? So do you wanna roll the dice and say, well, actually I've got patents that cover this software that maybe I find quite valuable to my company, but you know, I don't think there's a patent grant there, so you know, we'll, we'll throw that out there and then find yourself sort of having that argument later. Depends on your risk profile. Um, you know, or you could say, you know what, it's, very, it's, it's, it's possible that a court could find an implied patent li license here and I'm gonna, you know, maybe I shouldn't be sort of putting stuff in the open that I wanna protect. I mean, this, this, you know, this sort of starts a cut to your IP strategy, right? And, and I, think, uh, I think sort of knowing what it is that's important to you and, and what your company needs to protect and sort of be open about the rest, ideally, uh, is really, really important. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's sort of my key takeaway. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pragmatic about these things. I think you need to be pretty pragmatic uh, in terms of your risk profile in the company. But, um, but there, are, there, is, there is more case law than, than was discussed yesterday about implied patent grants. I, I've looked at it, it's the classic judge makes a call on a case-by-case -case fact scenario. There are no cases that involve open source licenses. Um, there are no uh, cases that I know of that have been brought uh, you know, uh, in that realm, whether or not they made it to judicial opinion. So it is, it is a bit of a, you, know, you, have to, you have to have your lawyers make a call. Um, but I, I find, <coughs> as a matter of equity, it hard to believe that you would be able to grant a copyright license to something and and then like reserve the other rights when you can't exercise a copyright without the, without the patent license as well. So anyway, that's my view on that. Um, so and then also open source licenses may also contain clauses um, about trademark names, like usually saying you, know, you can't use my name. And those clauses a lot of times aren't, they're not really, I mean it's, like it says restricting, which sort of sounds like not very open source, but a lot of times they're kind of restating what the law already is, right? I mean it goes back to that source identifying. So, you know, uh, for example, if you know you take the code and you modify it, which the copyright license allows you to do, then you know that you do, you can't necessarily use the trademark because now that it's something different, and you know that source identifier for whatever the the, the, the code was originally is is important to retain that um, ide that that identification. And so sometimes with licenses, say you know if you make a derivative work or you modify this, you, you can't call you got to call it something else, right? Which is pretty much what trademark law would sort of say, even if you didn't say it. Sometimes you have clauses in legal agreements that are, could, could almost not be there. I call them FYI clauses or, you know, it's a little, hey, remember, this is what the law says. Um, and then you have conditions, like I said, placed upon those enumerated rights. And open source licenses are, are non-exclusive and perpetual. They're pretty open. Okay, so I'm going to pause there. I don't even know. How are we doing on time? Are we, when did we start? We're about halfway through? Okay, call that. So, I'm gonna pause there before I go. Any questions, comments? Yes? It's a really probably trivial question, but in a copyright notice, sometimes the range of dates, what does that actually mean? Um, so the dates are supposed to reflect when the work was created or modified, you know, when new bits were, were added. And so, um, it's, it's, it's a pain to update that, <laughs> quite frankly, right? Because, I mean, software that's being iterated all the time, you probably can go like, yeah, it's been, you know, there's been enough new stuff added that, you know, rise the level of copyright, and so we can just put the range instead of like 2018, comma, 2019, comma, you know, whatever. But that's, yeah, that's what it's uh, alluding to. 
Okay, so can we get any? No. <laughs> um, all right, so I don't know. I, I threw these slides in here, and I'm trying to, I think I can skip them. Does everybody know the difference between object code or binary and source code? Yeah? Okay, good. I realized last night that that's another one of those, like, you know, assumptions you just kind of make. And, um, you know, it's like if I'm presenting to lawyers, sometimes I have to remember to kind of go back to that. Cause I, I, mean, I had a really great conversation one time with a lawyer and we were going back and forth, I don't know, negotiating a contract or whatever and they had these ridiculous terms they wanted with open source and, and it, was, it wasn't like making sense to me and my coworkers were listening and, I, and then I, I finally said, because I always like to assume the best, I always assume people know more than I do and whatever. And, I said, well, do you know what the difference between source and binary are? And he said, well, no. And I just thought, wow, man, I just wasted a, a lot of my time. <laughs> I should have asked him that like you know, an hour ago. Anyway, all right, so good. I'm going to skip these. Awesome. All right, so a note on terminology. You will hear, you probably heard throughout the couple days, people say open source software. People say free software. People say free and open source software. You might not have heard people actually say free Libre and open source software because that's kind of a mouthful. You see the abbreviations OSS. Don't use OS because that's usually operating systems. So that gets really confusing if, if it wasn't already. FOSS and sometimes FLOSS, the L being Libre. And you might be thinking, what the heck does this all mean? And so there are some philosophical reasons for these different terms, but pragmatically, it's the same thing. Okay, it's, open, it's software under an open source license. Um, free software is, is the term, a little more like, I think there's a little more like sort of passion behind that in terms of free as in freedom. Obviously, free in English also means no cost, so that caused confusion. Open source software came about um, with the idea that that was sort of more business friendly because businesses were afraid of this crazy free software movement. I, I mean, you, there's, there's interesting articles on the philosophy and people's preference of these different terms. Like I said, if you're, you know, from a pragmatic perspective, we're talking about the same stuff. Um, but, you know, I, I try to sometimes if you switch which term I use, depending on who or what I'm talking about, because, you know, it's kind of like saying lift or elevator, depending on if you're in the U.S. or the U.K., just sort of out of respect. But in any case, if that's, you know, d don't be confused by that. But it is, an, it is an interesting topic. But So here's a question I always like to ask. So what is open source software? Is it a development model? Ideology, legal construct, what do you guys think? What are your impressions? Not allowed to answer. <laughs> so, right, it's all three. Well, I mean, you know, I knew you were gonna say that, so. <laughs> so what do, I, what do I mean by that? So development model is all about, if you have access to the source code, that means anyone can tinker with it, right? They modify it, improve it. And then you benefit from that collective intelligence of many developers. So that is a development model. And that's actually a development model that companies are realizing is so um, great that they're sort of do, creating that even in, in inner, I think someone's talking about inner source today, within their companies, right? Like trying to, instead of having just really segmented teams working on stuff, being more open just within the confines of the company for, say, their proprietary code. And ideology, I kind of mentioned that, you know, belief in freedom and sort of a desire to share, belief that the source code should be free. So I think there is this underpinning ideology. Um, I don't really care if you agree with that or not, but you have to understand that and appreciate it, I think, if you're working in this space. That's something I definitely say to lawyers. Um, and then legal construct, right? The collaborative model and that ideology is sort of implemented via the license, right? Because that's what gives you the rights to, that says you have, you know, to, to, to do the things that you want to be able to do with the source code and so forth and so on. So the open source license gives you permission to use a program for any person, purpose, modify it, which is AKA create deriv derivative works. So I think modify is a little more accessible word and then redistribute the program to others, either your original version or the modified version. So this is a very shorthand definition of what an open source license is. If it doesn't do one of those things, then it's not open source. It, open source may or may not also be no cost. So this is where it comes back to where that sort of language definition versus you know, free, where you have like Libre versus gratis and other uh, uh, sort of a helpful distinction, but, um, but because a lot of open source software is actually no cost, you know, I think that, that gets a bit, um, can be cause confusion. And then 
sort of added this recently. Just because you have the source code doesn't mean it's open source. So I'm starting to see some licenses pop up that are like, well, we kind of want to be open source-ish. We want to give you the source code, but then put a bunch of restrictions on it. That's not open source. It's really, again, about, like I said in the beginning, you know, having terms and understandings that we all can rely on and we've taken a long time to get here is really important. You know, lawyers in contracts fight about definitions a lot, right? That, that can be, litigation can be all about that and I, I would really like to not have to have that argument. Luckily, I don't have to do that kind of stuff. So, free is in freedom, not free is in beer, the famous quote by Richard Stallman, which I just love. Um, and so, in terms of defining open source, there's a couple key kind of definitions. So, how many people have heard of Free Software Foundation? How many people have heard of Richard Stallman? No? No? Okay. Um, and so, so, Richard Stallman is considered the father of free software. Again, I'm using the term free software very intentionally. Founded the Free Software Foundation in 85. Launched the GNU project. GNU is a uh, recursive GNU, not in Linux, the operating, free operating system. And, and the mission there is really about freedom of source code and, and free software freedom and computer freedom. And there's a lot of, um, you know, really interesting uh, theories there. I mean, you know, again, whether you agree with it or not, it's, it's certainly worth um, kind of understanding that perspective. And then the open source initiative was created in 98. So this was a little bit, you know, open source was starting to become more popular and more used. And, and so the open source initiative begins to kind of be, to be a little bit more of a bridge because some people found the, the, the hardcore sort of freedom uh, approach, you know, a little hard for companies to kind of understand, you know, again, no opinion on that. And, um, and the big thing that Open Source Initiative has, which you've also heard a lot about, is open source definition. Now, I didn't reproduce these things on here that, that oh, sorry, I meant to say, the Free Software Foundation has the four, have four freedoms. I find the four freedoms takes a lot less time to read <laughs> instead of 10 definition, 10 things. But you, you should look at both of these. I mean, they're not, they're not inconsistent. It's just a different way of expressing essentially the concepts I put on the, the slide prior. Um, the, the big thing that Open Source uh, Initiative does is it approves licenses that are submitted to it on whether or not they meet the definition. So you hear about OSI approved licenses. Now let me clarify something I, I heard earlier today. Um, not all open source licenses are OSI approved. They may still meet the open source definition. Maybe that license wasn't submitted which is most likely the case. There are lots of open source licenses out there. Lots of them are sort of slight variations on existing ones. And they are just as much open source as one that's approved by the open source initiative. So I've seen people use definitions in, in legal contracts saying it's an open source license if it's OSI approved. I think that's extremely dangerous because you've just like made a distinction that's not valuable in terms of probably what you're trying to affect. Um, I've also seen people define open source as only certain types of licenses. I think that's also dangerous. Like, just stick with the general definitions we have, please. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, you know, so just remember the OSI, the OSI approved licenses is a, is, a, is a subset. It's a it's a short list. Like I said, not everybody submits their license to be approved. It's it's good to use those licenses because they're, they're, they tend to be the ones that are more popular and more and well known. There are some on that list that are really old and are not used. So even of that list of, that are OSI approved, there's like almost like a subset of that are like the really known popular or used ones. And then there's some that have, you know, kind of not, uh, and, and they're actually, some of those have been deprecated because they've had new versions of CCS. So anyway, so, so you know, good to, to be familiar with that and, and sort of understand that distinction. Okay, I kind of talked about this before, but I always think it's kind of helpful if you're someone, especially who's work, you know, kind of used to commercial licenses or uh, closed source <coughs> licenses, if you will, um, to kind of think about open source licenses are licenses. This is another thing I think people are like, oh, it's open source, it's free, I can do whatever I want. You're like, well, no, there's still a license. You gotta think about, you know, how, what that says and, and so forth and so on. So, so if you kind of think of it side to side, you know, open source licenses are just a unilateral permission, right? It's not negotiated. It's there. Take it. Take it. You know. Take it as it is. And anyone can use the code. There's no affirmative acceptance needed. It's a direct license from the licensor to each person who picks it up. That's a, actually a pretty important concept. Whereas proprietary licenses, you know, they tend to be negotiated terms. 
they can be quite specific to the parties. You know, you may have a product and every customer you have, especially if you're a small company and you're dealing with big companies, wants to negotiate. And every one of your licenses is slightly different because they want their term, you know, they want to get their little mark on it, right? Lawyers, some lawyers really like to leave their mark on an agreement even if they don't really need to. And as far as the grant of rights, right, we already talked about that. You can copy, modify, distribute. So wide grant of rights, right? This is like where copyright or, or the free software movement is like, I mean, we're going to take the copyright law sort of regime, which is sort of more default closed, right? When, when a work is created, you, you don't have a license in, until someone gives you a license. And we're going to use it to grant back these big rights. Whereas, you know, proprietary licenses usually have restrictions. You know, maybe you can only have so many copies. Maybe you cannot modify it. You, you can only use it for specific use cases. You can't distribute it, you know, what have you. And then as far as licensor obligations, open source software is as is. Take it as you find it. There's no warranty. There's no support. There's no... Um, you know, sort of guarantees around that, but you know, in, in the commercial world, that's something that sometimes that's the most valuable thing you're paying for, right? You might you buy something, and what you're getting, you know, what you're really paying for is like the warranties around it, support, maybe IP indemnification, and so on. Okay, so what is not open source software? So um, freeware. So freeware is like free as in cost, but usually no access to the source code, may have a bunch of restrictions, usually doesn't allow reverse engineering, for example. A lot of times they're like specific to that, to that software. I mean, probably every app on your, on your phone it probably has some kind of freeware license that I described. You, I mean, the ones that you, know, you didn't pay for, free. Um, this isn't, you know, and, and this is one of those terms where people kind of use it a little bit loose and fast. So I'm kind of putting some, you know, some, some a definition around it. Shareware is it's sort of like the same thing as freeware, but you know, it's, it could be demoware, trialware, you might hear like it's free for a certain amount of time, then you gotta, you know, pay up, or a certain number of t uses or whatever. Um, I mentioned public da domain before, um, so that is something that has, n is not copyright protected, mostly because it's, you know, the most common thing is because it's expired. Now, people have attempted to um, create a, dedic a public domain dedication. See, I'm not saying the word license. It's really hard to not say license. It's not a license because it was. <laughs> and, um, but you'll still hear people say public domain license because it's just easier to say license. But you know, it's basically like saying I've like disclaim all copyright and I'm pushing this out in the public domain. And that's never actually been tested in court. And there's some challenges around that jurisdictionally. And um, uh, and so a lot of times those, those, those agreements are drafted with like a fallback license. So it's sort of like if this doesn't work, then you just get a really broad license. I've also seen public domain dedications where then they put a condition on it. Now it's a license. So it's, it's just a sort of a, kind of can be a bit fuzzy. I think that the, the sort of the takeaway is that public domain could be open source. I mean, you do see things that are released under, or, you know, a, under these sort of dedications and the source codes provided, but, but open source not, is not public domain. So is that sort of makes sense. Um, and, oh, yeah, did that work? Okay, yeah, and so I think what, you know, again, because these, some of these things are free as in no cost, sometimes they get mistaken for free software, open source software, and so that's one of those really, you know, important distinctions, because if you think of this from an intern, you know, in, again, coming from the kind of in your company, from a procurement or development perspective, if, if you know, if, if you don't have some clarity on these differences, or at least, you know, and, and not to say that your developers should have to read the licenses and be like, this is a freeware license, or this is, a, you know, sometimes it's, you gotta read it really closely to figure it out, but, but you need to have that awareness, right, for obvious reasons, because you might have different processes for something that's like shareware that you need to eventually pay for than something that's open source. Um, okay, so <coughs> types of open source licenses, um, there's generally considered sort of two types that people like to talk about. Per permissive copy, uh, sorry, permissive open source licenses are generally those that give a broad grant of rights, I mean, which all open source licenses do, and then they have sort of minimal requirements, right? So the minimal, like you retain notices or provide a copy of the license, notice of modification, things that are almost like administrative, if you will, in terms of compliance. And then there's copy left. Um, and that usually means that the source code must be made available if you have a binary distribution, obviously if you're distributing in source, you already have the source available. And then that any modifications must remain under the same license. Now there's sort of some very varying nuances of that in terms of sort of strong copyleft is kind of extending to the whole work versus weak copyleft, which is you could, the other terms that are actually more helpful. It's file level reciprocal license or 
project level reciprocal license. Now, the other terms you hear are sometimes viral, contaminating. Um, don't use these terms, please. They're pejorative and, you know, a virus is something you catch and, I don't know, you should know what's in your software. It's not a disease. Um, hereditary, self-perpetuating, reciprocal, I think those are better words to kind of get your head around what copyleft generally means as a concept. Um, and, you know, when you're, if you're choosing a license in terms of stuff you're putting out, I mean, I'll talk more about this again later, you know, you really want to think about, like, what's your goals, right? Because what the license you choose is going to be going to be specific to sort of what the goals are to that project. Um, so just some examples of each of these. That should, yeah, okay. So MIT, BSD 2 clause, BSD 3 clause, Apache 1.1, you don't see that as much anymore, but that's sort of the older version from Apache. And then copyleft, these are sort of in order of sort of strength of copyleft. Mozilla and Eclipse being sort of file level reciprocal licenses um, and, and lesser general public license being sort of a lesser version of general public license, hence the name. And then a Faro being, um, being a bit stronger. Um, I'm gonna come back to that later. But so th these categories are really helpful. Um, however, you still need to read the license. So I think the, the you know, categories are as helpful for sort of shortcutting things, but again, you gotta be careful on those shortcuts because sometimes you just sort of go too far down that road and then you sort of forget to come back and go, well, hold on, what does that license actually, you know, really say? So um, you still need to read the license and, you know, and sometimes there's licenses that look a lot like another license and, um, but there's some difference in there and that can sometimes be hard to catch and that's where the light license scanning tools like Fossology that, Michael talked about yesterday are really helpful because that, you know, it's a lot faster to let a tool kind of do that matching for you than um, have a Word document in front of you or like, like lawyers do.